everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Between these rain showers and extended cloud cover, when the sun does finally come out, the combines have started to roll in southwest Oklahoma. We look forward to talking about harvest in the weeks to come right here on SUNUP. But today, we begin with a research study that looks at double cropping after wheat with soybeans. Here's SUNUP's Curtis Hare and our Extension Cropping System Specialist, Dr. Josh Lofton. We're here with our Cropping System Specialist, Josh Lofton. We're standing in a wheat field, but Josh, there's actually another crop that's planted in here. Yeah, yeah, so what we're looking at here is, is a kind of a very unique system, kind of a very niche system right now that we're having a, a, an evaluation of, and it's this intercrop soybean to where we actually have a, a wheat crop growing and a soybean crop growing at the same time. We're just testing the waters with the system right now. Um, you know, a, a lot of folks really like that wheat, wheat soybean system. That's a very good thing, especially when we get into that double crop acres. Um, but there are some folks that, that feel like that delayed planting on soybean, we just lose too many, or lose too much, too much yield. Um, and so we wanted to start looking at a system and, and uh, one to where we still have full season soybean and a wheat crop here. So this is a system that, that is run in other parts of the United States, oftentimes where there's you know, ample moisture throughout the season to where there's, there's never a competition for moisture. We wanted to see if, if in a system that, you know, here in Oklahoma is particularly where we are here in Stillwater, where moisture can be an issue, is can the system work and then start working our way back uh, to our typical soybean production region to see when we get a little bit more moisture, does the system continue to be beneficial as we go? Because if we can get a full season soybean crop and just lose a little bit of wheat yield where we have the soybeans planted, we, we, put, we potentially could have a very nice system here. So, you know, with that, does the, the price of the crops factor in with, with a decision of plant of using the system actually? Yeah, so, so the, the intent here is soybean prices are so nice right now and wheat prices are okay, but soybean prices are really nice. And so uh, we want to try to get as much out of the, the soybean as we possibly can while still having a good wheat crop out as well. When harvesting for wheat, is there a potential to damage to the crop when you have combines out in the field. Yeah, so that's one of the things we're looking at here is uh, one, when we're, when we're planting the soybean, how much damage do we do to the wheat? Um, when we're doing all our late season wheat management, so think about fungicides, insecticides, maybe even a late se season herbicide application, what are we doing to the soybean? And then on the flip side, when we're going in and harvesting the wheat, how much damage do we do to the soybean? And so we, we don't typically have a large enough bean to get in the way of the combine as it's going through. You just have to work on logistics, on, on like tire marks, you know, where you can drive, where you can't drive, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's kind of the, the crux of the system is you have to have uh, things set to where you're not driving on the crop that's just now getting going. And in this case, it's the soybean. Yeah, that's like fascinating research. Um, but before we let you go, you know, the topic uh, on sun up the past couple of weeks has been rain and weather and how that's affected the wheat crop. So how's that affecting summer crops? We're slow. The overall, that's just the, the general consensus. I think uh, one of two things are either happening. Either one, we're not planted yet. You know, the ground's just been too wet or haven't gotten everything ready, whether that be tillage or spraying or, or various other things. The, the big thing that we're going to have to start looking at is with all this rain, a lot of our herbicides are starting to break and we got a lot of weeds in the field. And so especially where we have limitations on growth stage to get herbicide out, make sure we're being very proactive on that. Um, I think enriched strips this year are going to be a very critical thing in our, like our corn and our milo, maybe even our cotton crop. So go get that enriched strip out if you haven't. And then if you have beans, they, they don't look very good right now, but they will. We got good moisture under them. Um, they're gonna start growing. Everything's gonna start growing. We just have to make sure that those other aspects like our weed control are, are really well managed because today or this year is gonna, gonna be a big issue. All right, thanks, Josh. Josh Lofton, Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. We have talked for several weeks about just how cool the spring weather has been in Oklahoma. 
To back that up, here is the average high temperature for Norman since May 1st shown in the blue field. The black line is this year's recorded temperatures. On only seven days did the high temperature reach the average line for that day. This cool weather, along with our wet soils, has most of our farming operations way behind schedule for this time of year. This week's USDA progress report shows that wheat harvest was only at 2%. This is 15% behind normal. Only 45% of alfalfa has been cut this year, down 30% of normal. And all row crop plantings, including soybeans shown here, are down. They are behind normal plantings by 21%. Of the crops that are planted, they also are growing behind schedule. This table is cotton degree days. It shows only 82% of the five-year average at Altus and 71% at Kingfisher. However, midweek a weather switch was flipped and now we are looking at multiple days above normal temperatures with limited rain. On Wednesday, forecasts were expecting the first 100 of the year at Hollis. These hot temperatures should be just what is needed to get our crop production back on track. Now here's Gary focusing on the rain pitcher. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, we did ask Mother Nature for a little bit of help getting that uh, wheat harvest started. She certainly complied. Uh, we also need a little bit more help with drought. Let's get to the latest maps and see what's happening. Well, our drought map hasn't changed much at all from last week. We still have that moderate to severe drought from southwestern up through central Oklahoma. A little bit of abnormally dry conditions surrounding that. Uh, a little bit to the southeast of that area. A little bit to the northwest, but looking good over most of the state. Like I said, Mother Nature did come through for us. Uh, we have started to dry out as we've gotten into June. These are the rainfall totals for June 1st through June 8th. Most of the state, uh, zero to a half inch or so. Now some areas, like down in southeast Oklahoma, 11.9 inches down there. That's an incredible amount for just uh, 10 days, or eight days rather. Uh, but most areas uh, on the dry side helping us dry out so we can get those combines and trucks out into the fields. The numbers aren't really important on this percent of normal map, it's really the colors. So we see the reds, oranges, yellows. Those are regions where the uh, rainfall is much less than normal. Then we look at the blues and greens, those are rainfall amounts that are uh, greater than normal. And this time of the year, we are still in the rainy season, believe it or not. Um, so. If you're wetter than normal during mid-June, you're still pretty wet. Uh, so, and if you're a little bit on the dry side, it's a little bit unusual, but we are seeing things dry out quite well uh, because we have had so much rainfall in most parts of the state. So now we'll see if we can actually get through uh, most of June getting all that wheat in, and then we'll just wait and see what's in store for us in the summer. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We are talking food safety now in the wake of cybersecurity attacks with Dr. Ravi Jadeja, a food safety expert at our Food Nag Product Center at OSU. Ravi, we saw what happened to JBS recently, um, the world's largest meat supplier. Get us up to speed and tell us what all this means in terms of food safety. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lyndon, for having me uh, on this segment. And uh, what we have seen was an unfortunate event. And what we have found is that uh, food industry, especially uh, big size food industry, they are relying on internet and um, computers more and more, just like any modern industry. And uh, because of that, uh, they were exposed to this threat. And in terms of food safety, uh, food industry, need to comply with the very complex regulatory requirements. And uh, these requirements uh, demand that food industry produce certain document when they are processing the food product. So when they cannot produce this document, that actually impact their capability to produce safe food product. Not only that, if they cannot provide this document to regulators, then uh, they may face a recall because certain type of documents they have to have when they send the shipment of the product to prove that that product was processed using a sanitary condition and it met all of the 
U.S. government as well as customer expectations. You mentioned the documentation, but in terms of moving forward and and looking at solutions, addressing some vulnerabilities, what does that picture look like for food processors, manufacturers, the industry overall? The cyber threat or cybersecurity threats are not new. Uh, Food industry is getting ready for this type of situation since some time. And uh, we see that there are so many other industries, they face the same situation. So the oil pipeline that got hacked was a very recent example. So food industry already has a very robust system. And in fact, they uh, have a backup documents and backup processes. So food industry typically include a policy or procedure and they time to time practice just like a, a fire drill. So I think uh, now moving forward, uh, food industry need to probably concentrate more because now they have seen this is a real incident. It's not that uh, it's a hypothetical scenario and uh, they already have a backup system. Probably they need to uh, practice a little more that how can they deploy that backup system quicker? So just in case if something like this happen, they don't need to stop production, but they can quickly deploy the backup system and continue producing their food products. For others involved in the agriculture industry uh, and producers, what do you recommend for them? Again, like uh, when I worked with the small and very small plants, um, I always advise them to have a backup system. Uh, If they are very small, they can probably quickly revert back to uh, paper documents and continue producing their food product considering or talking with the cybersecurity expert to do a vulnerability assessment of your computer system or your online system. And on top of that, uh, updating their food defense and business continuity documents to address this type of issue more effectively and more quickly uh, are the two major steps that uh, uh, food industry, especially small and very small companies should uh, do. Ravi, thank you for your guidance and perspective. It's good to see you. Thank you for being with us on SunUp. Thank you. Beef prices are high, but right now beef consumption is expected to decline in 2021 on a per capita basis. So tell us what's going on, Daryl. <laughs> sure. Well, when we look at per capita consumption, by itself it doesn't tell us much about beef demand because you know per capita consumption is really a measure of supply. Uh, Beef is perishable, so certainly on an annual basis, if we produce more, we'll eat more. If we produce less, we'll eat less. So we have to look at the prices in conjunction with quantity uh, to tell us much about demand. So what do we know about beef demand right now? Well, in the early part of 2021, um, both beef production and beef prices are high, which is an indication of very strong demand, and that's certainly the way I would assess it. As we go through the year, we think beef production may actually be down slightly for the year. And when we adjust that for trade, for, for net exports, uh, and also a little bit of population growth, then that's why we think the per capita consumption will go down in 2021. But that doesn't mean that beef demand is going down because again, prices are much stronger. It looks like beef demand is very, very strong. And what factors are influencing this uh, demand? Well, you know, we're always looking at price and quantity of beef, but in addition to that, we're looking at other factors that affect beef demand. So the other meats, we look at pork and poultry prices. Uh, We look at consumer income levels, and obviously economic growth right now uh, is a big part of the strong demand. So we take into account all of those factors, plus just the underlying preferences that people have for beef and whether or not there's any trends in that that we observe over time. And how are consumer demands, uh, preferences, kind of changing things up? You know, we've seen a lot of change in beef products over time uh, in terms of quality, in terms of the number of products and so on. So for example, if we look at uh, choice and prime grading, that has increased dramatically in recent years. Uh, We've gone from about 56% choice grading 15 years ago to about 75% now. Uh, Prime grading has gone from about 4% uh, just a few years ago up to about 11% now. Uh, So quality of beef has gone up and we continually produce more products. We fabricate them into more and more specific products, more boneless products, other kinds of things that consumers demand. And all of that adds value and it adds to our total beef demand. All right, thanks, Daryl. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. There's a 
lot of preparation that goes into a successful prescribed fire. It's not just a simple matter of going out on the day you're going to burn and lighting a match. If you want to make the fire help meet your objectives better, you need to do some planning and think about exactly what you hope to accomplish out of the fire. This particular area we're trying to manage for quail, so we really want to open it up and get rid of a lot of this overstory canopy. Right now a lot of that overstory is red cedar. So we can come in here and mechanically clip it with machinery, but in some places it's very dense and it's hard to get equipment to move around. So we're having to actually cut these trees by hand. But instead of having to cut all of these trees, which they would probably just get hung up in each other, we're cutting a few on the outside edge and letting them fall to create a really nice fuel base so that when we burn two or three months from now, these cedar will be highly flammable and will carry the fire up into the canopy of the wall of living cedars behind us. So we're helping make the fire more effective by creating a, a heavy fuel under the canopy of these trees. Some other things you might want to think about is to look around at potential invasive plants that might respond positively to fire. We've already identified on this site common mullein, uh, Cerecia lespediza, uh, a tree of heaven. All of these plants tend to increase after fire. So rather than burning and then coming up later and having to deal with those plants when they're more numerous perhaps, we're trying to target them now before the fire to eliminate them so that after the fire we might not have as, as, as big a problem to deal with. So if you'll take some time prior to doing a burn to really think about what your objectives are and what are potential things that you can do to make that burn more effective, and that's going to help you go a long ways towards meeting your land management objectives. Talking horses now, with a lot of rain in many parts of the state, mosquitoes are a concern and so is West Nile virus. Here's our equine specialist, Dr. Chris Heine. So uh, our spring and beginning of summer has been really, really pretty wet here in Oklahoma and generally with wet conditions and we also see an increase in insect population and particularly mosquitoes, which can carry quite a few diseases that can affect horses pretty severely. West Nile virus um, is going to be transmitted to horses through mosquitoes. They're actually picking up the virus from birds. So that's sort of the reservoir population. And you hear about uh, both humans and horses that actually can get West Nile virus. For our horses, our young, so generally horses that are less than five years of age, and then our older horses are going to be the most susceptible. Some of the hallmarks, it, they may or may not have a fever, so you can't always depend on that, but typically what you're going to pick up on is some of these neurologic effects. So West Nile virus does actually affect the neurological system of the horse. So you may see from mildly just depression and off feed to horses that are a little bit more droopy eared. The ataxia where they don't place their limbs correctly is kind of a hallmark. So anytime that we see any neurologic signs in a horse that sh sort of should send up some red flags to an owner and have a veterinarian look at them pretty quickly. Um, the downside of West Nile, if horses do get it, it has a pretty, pretty high uh, mortality rates around 30 to 40 percent of horses that get the disease may die. Um, and so we really encourage vaccination because this is a preventable disease to try to make sure that your horse doesn't get it. Typically West Nile we think about as one of the core vaccines. So there's like five core equine vaccines and West Nile is one of them. Um, so we usually always think about spring shots with horses uh, to get uh, either the core with all five or you can have them separated if you need it. Um, and then if you're in a really endemic area, which Oklahoma isn't one of the, like the heavy endemic areas, but in those areas with a lot of mosquito population year round, sometimes they'll even vaccinate uh, twice a year for it. And then remember mosquito feeding time of the day is dusk and dawn. And so if you have the ability to stall the horse or shelter them during those key mosquito feeding times, uh, I would recommend doing that. One great resource actually is the Equine Disease Communication Center. And so that's a great resource that you can track um, reported cases and know if some of these diseases are heading into your area. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow-Calf Corner on Sun Up. 
As we're all aware, we've had an unusual spring. We've had a lot of moisture, and we're getting a lot of feedback from cow-calf producers about foot rot issues and lameness as cattle continue to walk around on soft ground and with some heat around the corner and harder ground. We are joined today by Dr. Rosslyn Biggs. We're going to talk about foot rot and some lameness issues. And Rosslyn, how do we open up here? Well, I think it's important to note on foot rot that it's caused by a bacteria, but uh, it's, it's a bacteria we, we find in the environment, we, we see on, on cattle that are normal. But after we've had weather uh, similar to what we've seen this spring, really wet, lots of moisture. We have a breakdown of the skin in between the digits and that exposes the, the internal structures to, to this bacteria. And um, so we, we need to keep that in mind. Typically it's gonna be at least one limb that's gonna be affected. It could be all the way around uh, as well. And so, um, you know, we're, we're looking for a sudden onset of lameness, but we need to really take a close look because foot rot, although it, it's common, uh, is only about 20% of lameness. So we wanna make sure that it is truly foot rot. Any form of prevention out there for foot rot? Well, you know, there's, uh, there are vaccines on the market. I would encourage producers to, to visit with their veterinarians whether those truly make sense. In many cases, they, they may not make sense for them to, to utilize. And so as we move into the summer months, it's not that we can't see foot rot when it's, when it's hot and dry either because we all know what, what a cattle do when it gets hot and dry. Well, they congregate together. We see an accumulation of urine and uh, manure, and that creates those moist, wet environments, even though it's small and consolidated, and that can expose them to foot rot too. We also wanna make sure that they're on a good plane of nutrition, that we're not seeing, um, seeing deficiencies there, and um, also make sure that they're not having to track over areas that are gonna cause injury. To, uh, to the skin in that interdigital space, uh, that, that can lead us to problems too. So if we see it, we diagnose it, and we know we've got that swelling down there, what kind of cures, what kind of treatment right. do we see? Well, suggest? you know, it's really critical to, to make sure we're taking a look at those feet and not just because one, as I mentioned before, is lame, do we automatically go to foot rot. We wanna take a good look there and make sure that it's, we're confident that it's foot rot. Uh, we're going to have some antibiotic options to look at that and we also need to control pain management. It's a good idea, uh, as is any infectious disease of, of, of our herd, to isolate those animals so that we're hopefully not spreading it throughout the, throughout the group. And um, then also, you know, we, we want to keep an eye and make sure we're seeing a response to that treatment. We really should see some fairly significant response within about three to four days. And if not, we need to be consulting with our veterinarian to take a closer look. We've got a, a fairly recently revised foot rot fact sheet I would encourage folks to take a look at. And, and also another resource, uh, Dr. Jones with our veterinary school gave a um, lecture in our rancher series last fall on uh, foot rot or not is what it's titled and there's a there's a video they can spend uh, 30 45 minutes taking a look at at other things it in fact may be well thank you for joining us and thanks to you all for being with us again this week on cow calf corner on sun up we'll see you next week we're creeping into the middle of june which usually means combines are rolling throughout the state but kim the moisture has something to say about that but there are some combines out in the field so how is pro uh, harvest progressing probably running about 15 percent below average it, and it started late. You've got some fields where it's rain, they're too muddy to get the combines in, but then you get cloudy, high humid days like today and those wheat kernels just won't dry out so that you can get that wheat in the bin. You know the elevators, they'll uh, have a discount for wheat above 12 and a half percent so and they really want it below 11 and a half percent so it's they're having a hard time those berries drying out as we're moving further and further into june like what what is late harvest how does that impact uh, prices i don't think it has much impact on prices so maybe a minor uh, impact where you some local flour mills are dependent upon that wheat coming in i think what's driving prices right now is the supply and demand conditions both current and what expect on expectations you look at uh, u.s uh, wheat to stocks well below average. You look at world wheat stocks slightly below the records, but 
marginally tight. Uh, the market's watching what's going on in the Black Sea region. A uh, lot of talk about Russian uh, wheat production. Estimates anywhere from 2.8 billion to 3.1 billion bushels there. They've been lowering that a little bit. Uh, talk about Australia's uh, going to have another big crop. Uh, they've lowered that just a little bit over the last week. You go to the European Union, which is the number two exporter, followed uh, led by Russia being the number one exporter. They've lowered a, a, the European Union's wheat production estimate also, and I think that's what's driving, the weather's driving prices right now. You know, so shifting to the, just, just to the markets in general with wheat, corn, soybean, what's, you know, what is the market offering for those grain prices? Well, right now, uh, wheat uh, prices around Oklahoma, oh, six fifteen, six dollars and twenty cents. You can forward contract corn uh, for harvest delivery around five dollars and ninety cents. Uh, soybeans at thirteen seventy. Cotton, the futures markets above eighty six cents a, a, a pound, and canola's at a record price of twelve dollars per bushel. So, you know, you're saying th soybeans about thirteen dollars. Is that is that relatively high for prices like soybean and corn, frankly? Well, if you look at uh, wheat prices. Right now, you can uh, sell for six twenty. If you look at June, July, and August average over the last ten years, that's five dollars and fifty cents. So six twenty is well above that. The range is eight sixty three to two fifty eight. Uh, you look at corn, five dollars and ninety cents uh, forward contract. The average corn price during harvest, that's September and October, is four dollars and ten cents over the last ten years. Soybeans, thirteen seventy. The ten year uh, high price. The highest price over the last 10 years during the uh, October, November time period is $13.72. The average is $9.68. Yes, these are relatively high prices. You know, you know in closing, should producers, how, how should they take advantage of this? Well, I think the way to take advantage of relatively high prices is sell into that market. I think soybeans, how can you turn out, turn down a forward contract price that has only been there one short time period over the last 10 years? Uh, wheat prices above average, could they go higher? Yeah, but the odds are against it going much higher. All righty, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. That'll do it for our show this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.